Like you have to put down the spears, you have to put down the flamethrowers within yourself. Recognize that if you want to be at peace, you must forgive so that you can let go and move forward. So that you're not chained down by the past. So that you're not weighed down by the darkness. So that it may be relinquished and released into the sky. Alchemized into light. For whatever pain you choose to hold, know that it must require your breath. You must breathe into pain for it to perpetuate. For if we did away with all these words and if we did away with all these conceptualizations and if you were to truly sit into now, breathing deeply into now, pain does not exist. Your past does not exist. Your future does not exist. All that exists is now. Today we're going to talk about how to heal your past trauma, letting go of that abuse, that suffering that happened in one moment in time that does not have to dictate the rest of your life. You know, you may have been a victim at one time, but today we're going to learn to relinquish that concept, relinquish that identification with your victimhood, to move forward into who you could be, who you want to be, the life you want to live, the love you want to experience. I've received a beautiful message from one of my clients. Hey Adam, I hope you're doing well. Just wondered if you had any content you could point to or tips on how to heal a hurt locker. As you know, I'm in a bit of a transitional stage where number one, I'm moving out of my parents with the intention of never coming back and putting me through that sort of misery. Number two, tidying up relationships where it's just being give, 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 give on my end without any return or even respect. Big picture, the two things I feel I need are A, self-belief and B, healing the hurt lockers. I'm trying to build the self-relief through daily disciplines and setting myself up for private victories. But with some of the non-intimate relationship and work past pains, I'm not too sure where to even start. I want to make the new place a fresh start and want to leave some of the baggage behind. Would love to get your initial thoughts. I imagine the process of dealing with these things is long. This podcast is brought to you by BoldDojo.com, where you can book one-on-one coaching with myself in order to create action plans, overcome limiting beliefs, destroy negative self-perceptions, and egoic attachments. Have a listening ear to the trials of your life helping you to move forward. You can also sign up for the free weekly email newsletter, The Bowl Sip. It's just a quick sip of social dynamics and anything I'm exploring on Fridays. Just go to boldojo.com, sign that up. You can also hit up the free resources of wisdom where I drop my favorite books, movies, quotes, anime, documentaries, music, all of that, all at boldojo.com. And if you would like to help support this podcast, you can donate anything that you wish through the PayPal link, paypal.me forward slash A-D-A-M-O-O-I. Link is down below in the description. Or you can also donate directly through the website, also linked down in the description. Anything that you guys do donate is always extremely appreciated and just goes back to helping support the show and what I do here. So thank you very much. And if you do get anything from this piece of content, please let me know in a comment down below. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. And also please drop a thumbs up on the video. It just helps the YouTube algorithm, helps send out the video to more people in the community. And if you find that you resonated, share it with a friend who you think would resonate as well. Let's get into today's show. Thank you very much, X, for sending in that message. And when it comes to the Hurt Locker, I'll begin by explaining what that is for those who are not familiar with the lingo. So when it comes to Hurt Locker, it is the pain and suffering that you store inside of yourself, unwilling to let go, identified to your concept of self. Human beings have a tremendous problem with relinquishing that which has happened to them and not identifying what has happened to them as to who they are, a self-concept. So whether your parents abused you when you were a kid, told you you weren't good enough, told you that you were worthless, hit you, confined you, restricted you, limited you, overprotected you maybe. Maybe you became a mama's boy. Maybe you become a daddy's girl. Effectively disarming you from your own self-power. Disconnecting you from that which is inherent within you. The love that you feel inside. Maybe you were betrayed on by your boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe they hit you. Maybe they psychologically messed with you, gaslit you. Maybe they told you you weren't good enough and could find anyone better. Maybe just a random stranger in the street drove into you. Someone you didn't even know, causing you great harm, inflicting great pain. The suffering that we'll go through as human beings in our lives. Maybe someone was, in your mind, taken too soon. Maybe your best friend took his own life. Maybe your parent passed away too soon for you. What have you deem your trauma, your suffering to be? At some stage, you were a victim, yes. But this concept of victim is a very important one to understand which is that victimhood is a state and does not need to perpetuate beyond that moment in time in which it was inflicted. For if you continue to identify as a victim, you put that hurt in the locker. And that is what the hurt locker is. 
As human beings, we are predestined to go through hurt in our lives. As the Buddha once said in his Four Noble Truths, that one of them being, life is suffering. Which is a very general, very broad English interpretation of the original Sanskrit. And different interpretations may define it as existence is difficult. Existence is suffering itself. Existence is pain. You know, life is pain, life is suffering. However you would like to interpret it as, I'm sure these are all going to mean different things to you. However, when we go through moments, when we go through acute shock-term trauma, short-term trauma, we have a choice moving beyond that as to whether this informs who we are and changes who we are and allows it to become a ride-on. In part of my message that I received from a client, he used the word baggage. Baggage is another great word. Baggage is something you would store in the locker, yeah? Baggage in his uh, terms there being the pain, I guess you could identify that with. So just summarizing this point here, when we talk about the hurt locker, if you have a deep hurt locker, if you have a filled, full hurt locker, it's because you have not been able to let go of the pain that has been inflicted upon you. You have identified as a victim, whether you are consciously aware of it or not, or just subconsciously, 100%, that you walk with this now. This is part of your identity. It's part of your concept in life that because my mother or father abused me, because my boyfriend and girlfriend cheated on me, right? that means I'm worthless. That means that I'm damaged goods. That means that I am incapable of experiencing love, peace, and joy that I seek, not only wish to give, but seek to receive myself. So if we look at the specifics of my client's message there in regards to a toxic relationship with his parents in which that I know that he was physically and psychologically abused from a very young age, these are the things I know because he's my client. Also, number two there of just relationships in which that you always give, 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 and they always take, take, take. They never seem to respect you or value you for that. And also number three, just wanting to start afresh, letting go of this pain, moving forward into a better life and a better person. It all starts of healing the hurt locker to his fundamental question of how to do so. So, how to heal the hurt locker? Part one, forgive. Forgive first, always. Never forget, but always forgive. Because if you cannot forgive, you will never let go. And if you never let go, how could you ever move forward? For those that have suffered the most egregious of abuse, whether it be someone physically penetrated you about your desire, someone was taken away from you in an unjust manner, maybe a callous murder, or maybe just a stranger, as I said before, slammed into your car on one summer's afternoon and you lost your legs. Physical reminders, psychological scarring, all of the above. I like to take this principle of entry point to forgiveness, making it easy for those of you who have suffered something of that kind, and you can always just reverse engineer your way back from there, whoever you are listening to this. Parents abused you as your kid, whatever it may have been. That we offer forgiveness, not because we believe they deserve it, but because you deserve peace. This is always the beginning point for those that are suffering extreme abuse, suffering that have held their holocaust for a very long time. Because while it is not the end point of forgiveness, to start with the end point is often too far. It's too much of a jump for most people. If you stay for the end of this video, we will get to the end point of forgiveness, which is ultimate forgiveness, which is a totality of forgiveness, a complete harmony, but just at the bare minimum particularly for those that are having to deal with, such as my client here, a toxic relationship with their parents that has ill-positioned them throughout their teenage years, their early 20s, and they now end up around 30 or so, and they realize that the way that they perceive relationships, the way that they perceive themselves is corrupted and a direct result corruption of the way that their parents treated them when they were younger. It set them on the path. It coded them. It programmed them to see themselves as either unvaluable, unworthy, removed from the possibility of excellence however it may have been and you developed a coping mechanism to deal with that shutting people out unable to maintain intimate relationships how many of you listening to this find yourself in that position get close to someone push them away I know a lot of girls been with a lot of girls that have experienced this level of what i refer to as ice turtle shellness become ice turtle shells when they're shown good energy why why would you do so why would you push that away that's all you know because you know, the only energy you've ever known has been bad energy, energy that treated you poorly. So you learn to form a distaste for the characterization of that which gave you such energy. If it was your father that abused you, you maybe then seek throughout the rest of your life to 
push away from masculine energy in all forms because it was once masculine energy that abused you. Flip the, flip the reversals. If you're a young male and it was your mother that told you you weren't good enough, if it was your mother that screamed you out, if your mother was that told you that you were broken and that you're never going to amount to anything, you might find it very difficult to form a harmonious, well-balanced, equanimous, loving relationship with a feminine being after that. Or vice versa, you might flip to the complete firebird shell, or firebird end of that particular spectrum, in which that you cannot exist without it. So you will accept any form of treatment, masculine and feminine, depending on what the uh, perpetrator or abuser was made up of. This is what I'm painting here, is that it can go both ways. You can see people that were abused by their uh, masculine role models at an early age and then seek to only find that more because they identify that as part of their self-concept. And so they will seek that type of energy regardless of how poor the treatment is. Ice turtle shell, lusting firebird. Seems to be the, uh, the common cause, or the common result, I should say, of a common cause. Now, taking a step back from this deep explanation we've just gone into, I was really just on that first tangent point of, first point of forgiveness. Forgiveness first, because we must be able to let go in order to move forward. And if you cannot find it in your heart to forgive them because you see yourself in all of them, because you see yourself in all beings, you don't find yourself separate from the threat of life, the existence of life itself, which is a much higher level of forgiveness and a much higher level of understanding of who you are. If that's too much of a jump, which is why I didn't begin this video of this, if it's too much of a jump to get there right now, it's definitely the path. It's definitely where we would like you to end up. But I make the concession and I hope you can make the concession for yourself as well, which is to say it's enough to get yourself on the path of forgiveness just by solely from the beginning saying that I will forgive them because I deserve peace and I cannot be at peace if I cannot let go of the event, the trauma, the pain that caused at that moment in time, which then would lead us to realize that we are not our pain. We are not our victimhood. Even that concept of victimhood, even that that concept of a state of being a victim. It doesn't have to be. Just because your mom chewed you out when you were three years old because you made a mistake and told you that you were a broken piece of shit doesn't mean that you are now a broken piece of shit and that you perpetually had to be a broken piece of shit for the rest of your life. You were a victim at one time. That is a state in time. If you choose to identify that for the rest of your life, then yes, you will perpetually be a victim. But it doesn't have to be the case for you. So, coming back in here to the forgiveness principle, let's take that one example right there because I know it's the case for my client right here in which that his parent, his dad used to beat him uh, and there was very little positive encouragement in their relationship. I also have another client I'm dealing with right now who's just for the first time realizing how poorly his mom treated him. His mom at one stage forcing him to pray to God to ask God to fix him because he was broken. It's pretty heavy at the age of four or five years old. For both of them listening to this, because I know both of them will be watching this, and I'm sure the rest of you can relate. How can I forgive the person that caused me so much pain? I know that I need to forgive in order to be at peace. I get that now. But how can I forgive them for doing such wrong, for setting me up for such a life of pain? This is where we must come to an understanding of what our nature in life is as human beings, that we are all imperfect. It is the state of humanity to be imperfect, and it is our pursuit of perfection in which we will find fulfillment, wholeness, that as we work to be the best version of ourselves, Every day, as you work to bring the best of your love, peace, and joy out to serve the, re the beings of this world, to make the use of your time here. That journey is not always clear. That journey is not always there for all people in plain sight. Think about who that person had to be to abuse you the way they did. I inherently do not believe that human beings are evil and bad. And if you're one of my two clients right now, think about what your parents had to go through in order to think that the best method of disciplining you and treating you was to abuse you. Do you think they saw it as abuse? Do you think that they were so inherently evil to think that I will go ahead and abuse my child here? 
For most human beings, this is not the case. There are some. There are some examples in history of human beings that are so lost, that are so psychotic, so sociopathic, in which they delight in causing pain and harm. Very few, though. Very few. Maybe 1% of the population. I think for both of my clients listening right now and the majority of people watching this, the answer would be no. That I highly doubt my parent sought actively to abuse me. So why did their actions come out as abuse then? Have you asked? And have you come to the reasoning or the understanding in which that is likely because they themselves were in pain? They themselves were expressing the pain through which that was caused to them. And so a generational cycle of pain is being lived through again and again. For that other client that I had in which that his mom forced him to pray to God to fix him because he was broken. What is she expressing there? Her own lack of belief in her own wholeness. Her lack of self-belief in realizing the purity which exists within her. The perfection that exists within her. Her connection with herself. She's expressing her disconnection with herself. As to why, as to how, we would need to go back through her story. As for my client who sent in the message for today's video, his dad who used to physically abuse him. Why? Why would he do such a thing? Maybe he could rationalize it logistically and logically as, I'm disciplining my boy. I don't want my boy to become a failure in life. I don't want society to see him and to see our family as failures. He must be rigid and strict and must be well disciplined. He can see the boy's tears. He can see the boy's disdain for him. Why would he perpetuate such behavior? What is it that was maybe told to him once? Broken within him once? That would force him to act out of such desperation? What is he desperately clinging to? What is he desperately hoping to find within himself, in his son? What is it that he was not able to live up to within himself? Or maybe find connection to within himself that he now is forcibly oppressing upon his son. I take you down this rabbit hole of thinking because at every source of pain, you will find a reason why. And it all comes back to one thing, which is a disconnection from the truth within, the beauty within. Pain, trauma, being the fire which burnt that bridge down. Yeah. But why do we go into this? Because of forgiveness. Apart from the 1% of sociopathic, psychotic human beings in this world who would delight in just causing pain for the sake of causing pain, that means 99.99% really of all the other situations you're ever going to see and that you're experiencing right now are going to be the result of someone else who is also in pain And that whether they could see it or not, whether they're conscious of it or not, was that they were acting out of pain. They were acting out of a disconnection from themselves. So how can we forgive someone who's caused us so much pain by recognizing that they too were in pain? That there was not a hatred for your essence of who you are. I would say in most cases that I've ever come across with the clients that I've worked with, their parents, if it was parents or if it was their romantic partners, that abused them, domestic violence, physically, psychologically, gaslighting. They were doing it because they were only projecting the darkness, that disconnection within themselves. Not because they wanted to hurt you, but because you happened to be in the firing line. The bullet and the trigger was going to be pulled anyway. You just happened to be in the firing line. And I see that with both my clients here particularly. And when it comes to children, And you didn't have a choice. You were unempowered, disempowered. Such is the state of life. Such is the state of human beings. Such is the state of imperfection. And now we can, now coming on to that state of imperfection, another pillar in your understanding of what forgiveness is, is to realize that you are not perfect. How can I forgive someone who's abused me so much? by realizing that I too am not perfect. 
I am not cut from a different cloth. I am not made from a special breed and species that is infallible and removed from the possibility of wronging and erring myself. Given a certain set of circumstances, if I had gone through the exact same experiences as the perpetrator, could I say so confidently that I would not too have conflicted and committed the same oppression, anger, abuse, trauma towards myself, in quotes, in that analogy? Would, could you say so confidently as what I'm saying, that if you were in the same position as the person that abused you, that you would not have abused you, having the same set of life experiences? What we're looking at here is stepping into stage two, really, of today's podcast or today's session, is compassion. We're really starting to talk about compassion here, empathy, for the understanding of the situation. And it always brings me back to the Dalai Lama's story, which can be found in the Book of Joy, I believe, in which that the Dalai Lama, as he was fleeing from Tibet, Tibet as the Chinese were invading, he secretly went back in disguise to his temple to say one last goodbye. And one of his friend monks was there. And it was the last time he was ever to see him for, I think, 20 to 25 years as his friend monk was not able to escape and was taken into the Chinese gulags. But it was about 20 to 25 years later, his friend somehow survived among 20 others of several hundred that perished. 20 survived or so. And the Dalai Lama asked, how? How did you make it out of this Chinese gulag? His friend described that the Chinese gulag was a mixture of three different types of tortures. There was a Chinese torture, German torture, uh, Japanese torture, and it was all combined within this Chinese gulag. The conditions were so brutal that they had very little to eat and they had resorted to cannibalism and having to eat the dead prisoners. But sometimes they were so hard frozen, the bodies so frozen they couldn't eat them. But after all of this and detailing all of this, the monk said to the Dalai Lama, I was at most at risk from losing my compassion for my Chinese torturers. Amongst this 20-year battle of survival for existence every single day, ripped away from your home, put through the most arduous of conditions, having your purpose in life taken away, watching your friends around you die, having to eat them, he was most at risk for losing his compassion for his Chinese torturers. For he had seen the humanity within them. He had seen that they were not so different to him. And had he found himself in their position, could he have confidently have said he would have done any different? The ego is a powerful thing. We would all like to think that if we were born in Nazi Germany, that we would have been the ones to stand up and say, no, no, let's not kill and recklessly destroy civilizations worth of people because we believe we're better than them. We would all like to believe that. So wrapping up this portion, bringing this portion of forgiveness when it comes to healing hurt lockers, Forgiveness first, entry point. Why? Because if you cannot forgive, you cannot let go. And if you cannot let go, you will never be at peace. And surely you deserve peace. Surely you deserve peace. And there are so many examples of families that had their sons, their daughters ripped away from them, murdered, raped, that were able to forgive their perpetrators. Not because they inherently believed. Some of them, yes. There was one particular famous Christian family uh, in here in Australia that uh, lost five or six children, I believe, in a car accident, and they were able to forgive the perpetrator because they believed inherently in their faith that forgiveness was the way. Some people, whether they do or do not, because they believe that everyone deserves forgiveness or not, surely that you deserve peace. And so you have to come to that place. Like you have to put down the spears, you have to put down the flamethrowers within yourself. Recognize that if you want to be at peace, you must forgive so that you can let go and move forward. So that you're not chained down by the past. So that you're not weighed down by the darkness. So that it may be relinquished and released into the sky. Alchemized into light. For whatever pain you choose to hold, know that it must require your breath. Pain requires your breath of existence. You must breathe into pain for it to perpetuate, 
For if we did away with all these words and if we did away with all these conceptualizations and if you were to truly sit into now, breathing deeply into now, pain does not exist. Your past does not exist. Your future does not exist. All that exists is now. But to gain access to now, that ticking monkey mind must be settled. You must be even desire settlement. For if you do not desire peace, if you do not desire settlement, how could you ever forgive? Now moving this forgiveness concept along into stage two, which is not just forgiveness for them, now you must forgive yourself. To have complete forgiveness and true forgiveness, you must forgive the person you were at that time who received that abuse and that trauma. Now this may sound initially a little contradictory or a little counterintuitive, I might say, but for the people I work with, this client, the other client I described before, you hate that you were the one that was disempowered. You hold on to these negative self-perceptions in which that, why wasn't I strong enough? Why couldn't I run away? Why couldn't I have said, no, don't say that to me, or no, don't do that to me? And so you live within this idea, this concept of that, I don't like who I am. I don't love who I am. I wasn't enough and I'm still not enough. The limiting beliefs, negative self-perceptions, the goic attachments, they just keep rolling on like a hamster wheel. So forgiveness must be offered to not only the perpetrator, but to yourself, your past self, that 12-year-old boy, that seven-year-old girl version of you that was unempowered at the time, that was at the mercy of the perpetrator at the time. Yeah? It's largely the same concept as forgiving another in terms of we're all imperfect. So we realize that. So you just have to apply all of what we said at the beginning of this video to yourself now. But it is not something to be done half hast half happily in a brief moment. It must become complete. You must completely realize that there are powers, there are people, there are events in this life that you will never have control over. May it be the best life you can live in which that you do not incur so many events to the point in which that you wish to take your own life. But at some point, your life will end. And knowing that your life will end and will be finite in this physical manifestation as a human being, wouldn't you have liked to have lived a life looking back having said that, I forgave myself. Not only for the mistakes that I made, but for the mistakes that were committed upon me and which that I couldn't retaliate or which I couldn't move away from. That I had to form coping mechanisms. That I had to, for example, one of my clients who was told that he was broken at age four to five years old, then seeks throughout the rest of his life to excessively prove himself. To have to always see himself on the pursuit of constant striving, never arriving, and excessively avoiding failure at all costs. So really, never really truly knowing himself or seeing himself. Always living within a husk, within a shell. Never really delivering his true fruits to the beings of this world. Living through a mask. Don't you want to end your life? Be at the end of your life. Having realized that. I forgave that boy a long time ago. And so I was able to live the best life I possibly could. For the client that messaged in here. For your parents that abused you when you were young. For the friends that have been take, take, taking and you're always on a give, give, give. Don't you want to look back on your life? Having said that, I forgave myself. How does that, I mean, just me saying that brings a smile to my face. It brings a smile to my heart. I haven't described any of my personal experiences in this video yet. But for those that don't know, when I was, I don't think I've ever described this in a podcast either. I think I've, I've some, some of the website I've written about in articles. But when I was younger, for the first three months of my life, actually, my father abandoned me and my mother. My mother almost died actually giving birth to me. She had to receive a blood transfusion on the table and was, in her words, uh, going towards the light. But the obstetrician and doctors in the room uh, told her not to go towards the light and brought her back. But in the three months... After my first inception, we were kept in a specific, very special hospital just purely for women suffering the deepest levels of depression, postnatal depression, 
in which back in those days, their cure for was a electro stimulation, basically a frying of the brain, which of course caused long-term uh, issues and uh, chemical imbalances in the brain and things that my mother has had to deal with. But I paint this out so that you could understand that during this time, my father wanted nothing to do with myself or my mother. It was effectively abandoned us. Barely came to see us. I don't think he even came to see us once in the hospital after my first three months. As a infant, I am not consciously aware of being abandoned at that time. But I am subconsciously a sponge for all the emotions that my mother is feeling of abandonment. I'm feeling her stress. I'm taking on her stress, her depression. I'm soaking all this up. And then throughout the rest of my life, a pattern emerges that I cannot be alone. I fear being alone. I cannot do anything on my own. If I go to the park, go to the gym, walk to school, go see a movie, go to my first job interview. When a girlfriend starts hanging out with other friends, if there's males involved, extremely jealous, I must always be with someone, must always do it with someone else for I fear being alone. Where did this pattern emerge from? Well, if you were abandoned in your earliest of stages, And you had to develop a coping mechanism to deal with that, such as, well, I must always be surrounded. I can never walk in my own autonomy. I can never walk in my own solidarity, my own isolation, if you will. For isolation must mean death to me, egoically. So I learned to cope with it. And it's not until maybe 18, 19 years old when I recognized this and I forced myself to undergo the process of self-cultivation walking a path of supreme excellence, developing my own principles, direct, congruent, authentic, with empathy, seeing life as a temple, designing a purpose, physical, mental, social development of a transcendence of knowing who I am, effectively cultivating myself into who I always wanted to be, who I always could have been, reconnecting to who I am. And so I walk that path for the next 10 years so you find me here now, sitting in front of you. I could sit here and I could sit here and say that and put the blame on so many people, including myself. I could put the blame on my dad, who's no longer, no longer with us anymore. I could put the blame on my mother for imprinting me with those emotions, but it would all be frivolous, inconsequential, and irrational. To blame my mother makes no sense at all. She was. The pain, whatever pain she was expressing, which I absorbed, was a result of pain she was experiencing from someone else. Do you understand that? It goes back to part one of this video, doesn't it? Why we should forgive and why we should have compassion for other people's experiences. I could blame my younger self for not having recognized early enough, for having let it get to when I was 18 or 19. Why didn't I know soon enough? Why didn't I do things faster? Why couldn't I have been stronger or better? Does that change anything? Does hating my past self change anything? Does it make me feel better? Would it make you feel better? I'm sure it doesn't. And I'm sure I never will. You know what does make me feel better? Moving forward and closer. Next principle, moving forward and closer. What does that mean? To move forward in your life, which means you intrinsically have to let go of what was before what was left behind you to leave behind in order to move forward. As I had reeled off a bunch of things I just said about how I came to be where I am now, designing my own principles in life, designing a way of living in life in which that you see life as a temple being built, all to the end point of wanting to help other people, to serve the best of your gifts to the beings of this world. That's moving forward. Part two, moving closer. What does that mean? Closer to who I am, which effectively means closer to everyone. For I am everyone. It's not enough just to live life for yourself. You want to heal your hurt like you want to heal your pain? You have to get beyond yourself. You have to utilize that pain in order to develop yourself. But why develop yourself? So that you could help someone else. 
For if you're going to develop yourself and you're going to move forward, that's no easy task. That's no simple task. That's not something that would easily be achieved and maintained for a long, long period of time in order to really generate anything of meaningful substance. To generate anything of meaningful substance, you must commit yourself to inordinate levels of energy, effort, the sweat and tears, and a pain for which you would smile for the rest of your life. If it's just for you, maybe it lasts a few days or a few weeks. If it's just for the validation of other people to see how cool you are, how amazing you are, You're at the mercy of others. Who's filling your cup? And what kind of cup is it? When you ask someone else to fill your cup, you're asking them to fill a cup that has no bottom. A cup filled by others inherently has no bottom. The source of validation matters intensely. If it comes from outside of you, then it is never something that would ever stay with you. You're always at the mercy of the highs and lows of whether it's there or not, whether people approve of you, yes or no. Your social media... Your work, friends, family. If you're doing things for other people just so that you can look better, so you can feel better about yourself, it's an illusion. It's a roller coaster that eventually is going to break down. Source of validation coming from the internal, from inside of yourself, in which that I decide to be the best version of myself, I decide to generate the best of principles, the best of development that I possibly could. Because I know that it's going to help someone else. And whether they can see it or not, I'll do it anyway. Walking down the beach, smiling at a stranger, saying, hey, how are you? Whether they return that energy and that light or not, does not diminish your light. Another key concept here in terms of healing her locker, which is to realize that the value that you generate from inside of yourself is not dependent upon whether someone gives it the nod whether someone stamps it with a green tick or not. For if you've connected to the wholeness within you, the truth within you, and you know that you are doing things so that you could improve the experience of life, so that you could reduce the suffering and increase the love, peace, and joy in people's lives, whether they can see that or not, that's not within your control. Now, it just so happens that most human beings recognize love, peace, and joy. They recognize a true smile. They recognize a true hug. They recognize true intent to do the best, to want the best for you, for them, for all people. And so it just so happens that if you do act from that place, people will give you that. For those listening on the audio, I smiled. People smile back when you smile. When your eyes smile, people smile back at you with their eyes. When your heart smiles, people smile back at you with their hearts. You can breathe deeply into that one on the smallest levels and then you can just upscale from there to whether you want to generate value for a company, for your own company, for your own business, for communities. That's all that life is. That's all that society is. It's just communities of people doing things together, hopefully, to help as many people as they can. And of course, human beings do not always get it right. As we've discussed in this podcast, imperfection is our condition. So bring this point back in. This all stemmed off forgiving yourself. That was the main ticket of this part of the podcast. You must forgive yourself back at the moment and the inception point of the hurt, the pain, the trauma, in order to make sure that you do not become a victim. See, when you're looking at this concept of the hurt locker, the hurt locker is predicated on the fact that you still believe yourself to be a victim because only a victim holds a hurt locker. If you do not believe yourself to be a victim, then your pain does not be- your pain does not stay with you. Say that again. If you do not believe yourself to be a victim, then your pain does not stay with you. You let your pain go as it appears. It appears and disappears. You are neither attached to the coming or the going of your pain. Clear mind like the clear moon. Clouds might come and go, interrupting your view of the moon. But the moon is always there. Do not be attached to the coming or going of the clouds. 
for the truth always exists behind them. As once described by Zen master Sung Sung in Dropping Ashes on the Buddha, clear mind, like the clear moon. Beautiful. So forgive yourself. If we can just get a little recap here. Forgive them. Forgive yourself. Move forward in life. Move closer. Closer to who you are. Closer to who we all are. Closer to who you are. Closer to who we all are. This is the final point of today's session. And when it comes to healing the hurt locker, if you can forgive others, forgive yourself and move forward and closer. But that final little point, we just need to flesh that out just a little bit more. Because that really is the final pillar, which is the reconnection to who you are. Reconnection to the truth that exists within you. Healing the hurt looker. So far, we've just been through the events of things, the people of things. We've not looked particularly inwardly, deeply into who you think you are. So, who are you? The birds sing and the lemons dance on the trees. This is who I am. Who are you? As I said somewhere at the beginning of this podcast, we can certainly say who you're not. We're certainly not your name, certainly not your date of birth, certainly not your occupation. These are all fleeting, erroneous things which have but a concept of illusion to them. There was a time before all those things, there will be a time after all those things. There was a time where you were alive before all those things, before you were even aware of them. You are not your pain. You are not the things that have been done to you. You are not the things that you have done to others. These are products of who you are. These are manifestations of who other people are. But what's said of the person generating those products? Your core essence, your center, your nature. Whether you would like to adapt it to words and identify to words such as God, light, source, Tao, Buddha nature, spirit. It does not matter. These are all but rafts helping you to cross a river to which you would find the truth laying peacefully on the other side. An embodied feeling within you is which you must find connection back to. I'm not asking you to generate anything new here, but at some point along your journey, if you're still holding on to hurt within you, pain within you, then you have disconnected from that truth within the other side of the river within you, the moon within you, the core of who you are. You fool yourself with incessant chatter of the mind. For some of you, at the core level of just thinking, I am what's been done to me, I am what I've done to others. For those that are a little little bit more advanced in their self-concept or understanding of who they are, okay, I'm not, not all those things, but then I must be this body or I must be this mind. I must be this ego at the minimum. Then you realize if you can unpick that a little bit more, which is that these are just attachments to my own thoughts. What happens when I cease thought? What happens when thought ceases? If there is no past and there is no future, what is there? In the wise words of Matthew Burnside, rest in peace, there's nothing but the moment. So there's nothing to love but right now. Thank you, Matt. Couldn't have said it better myself. So we can dig down to really the bottom layer here. If you would like to, and if you would be so interested in desiring a life in which that not for a moment do you cease the victimhood or do you cease your hurt lockedness 
your pain, your attachment to abuse and suffering in your life. But eternally, ongoing, living throughout your days, only moving forward, only moving closer. You must come back to who you are. You must reconnect to your true essence in life. That with no name, that with no past or future. In this podcast, I must use some form of language to communicate the truth that I know within myself. So I look outside and I see lemons on the tree and I hear birds in the wind and this is who I am. I could just as easily say that I'm the bottle of water in the fridge or I am God himself or I am a combustion of stardust and particles forming themselves in matter. It matters not. These words matter not, because they only convey the truth that I know within myself. I can hear some of you now saying, okay, I think I understand what Adam's saying, but how to get there? How can I feel what Adam's feeling? Well, if I could somehow describe to you what it is to feel whole and to feel true and connected to who you are, probably all of life's problems would be saved. There would be no need for war. There would be no need for ideological work politics. There would be no need for destruction. So how did I get there? How did I cross the river in order to realize that there was no other side? How did I look up at the moon in order to realize that the moon was within me? Meditation is probably the first activity I could point towards. I know. I know I just heard a million of you just go, (sighs) why? Why did you sigh? Why did you sigh? Why? Because you knew that was what I was going to say? Or because you knew that it's not what you wanted to hear Because it's not sexy, it's not new, it's something that's been practiced for thousands and thousands of years and yet still remains the number one remedy. Why? Well, surely if something that's been practiced for thousands and thousands of years and still today in the chaos of what appears to be Western 21st century society still remains the number one remedy of getting someone to understand who they are, to put down their past, put down their future and access the moment now. Don't you think there's something to that? Don't you think there's something to this process of just sitting in one spot, regardless of how much thought comes to mind, forcing yourself to sit in one spot and to focus singularly on one thing, your breath. Whether you would like to use mantras and you like to use transcendental meditation, the TM method, or whether you would like to use any other form of meditation there may be, whether you would like to use a moving form of meditation at least, but has the confines and the parameters of something that, such as yoga, that would force you to reckon with your breath. Because some of you may get a little bit wayward with this and say, well, I get pretty single-minded when I'm focusing on video games. Yeah, but does it force you to focus on your breath? Does it force you to connect with that which exists within you? That's how you can throw out video games pretty much straight away. So, yes, there are many forms of meditation. But when I say meditation, I am being a little bit liberal with it. It doesn't have to be a literal sit down, focused, singular point on breath. Zen, sitting Zen, Zazen, doesn't have to be that. It could be many other different forms. It could be, say, walking around in a circle outside repeatedly for an hour. It could be walking down the beach in which there is no external distraction if you happen to find an isolated beach. There are many ways of entering meditation. Walking meditation, sitting meditation, standing meditation, whatever, maybe. Okay. But if you're going to do something, an activity in which that you are forced to focus on one thing and that one thing draws you inward, it brings you inward to settle the mind and to connect with the body, with the spirit that exists within. You breathe life into yourself. Doing that for if but five minutes a day to begin with. At first, it is arduous, and at first, it is difficult, which is why so many people sigh at it, because they 
one easy. But tell me, if it was so easy to relinquish your Hurt Locker, would you be watching this video right now? Probably not. If you wish to evolve your beyond your current state, if you wish to evolve beyond your current state, surely you must do something you have not done before. Surely you must engage a process far more difficult than you have realized. For whatever you have realized so far has got you to where you are now. And if you are unsatisfied with that current state, then you must entertain and must be willing to commit yourself. So commit yourself. Start early. Start easy. Start before anything distracts you. Wake up in the morning. Five minutes. Sit down. Singular focus. Something that brings you inward. Mm. Come to know yourself. Come to see who you are. And during these five minutes, the breath is what's there for you. The breath is your center. You needn't lash yourself for how much you may stray, but only reward yourself for how much you come back. Maybe ideas come back of, yeah, fuck mom. She hit me when I was younger. Yeah, fuck dad. He messed me up. He told me I was no good. Ooh. There was a thought, come back. Ah, come back. There's your reward. Every time you come back. Because who are you coming back to? Why does that make you feel good? Why is it so pleasurable to experience one moment of the gap? A gap in conversation of your ego. What exists within the gap? Pure perfection. Within the gap of your mind and your incessant ego, you may access the truth of who you are and the truth of now. That's why I feel so good. If you could experience this one time in five minutes, well done. If you can hold this state for more than 10 seconds, doing very well if you could spend minutes minutes within an hour experiencing a complete deletion of self and time experiencing a true fullness of who you are I dare say that you are someone that I would like to spend some time with although maybe we already have Maybe we already have. Healing your hurt locker requires a rendition of activities, mental activities that elapse through, as I have said throughout this podcast, forgiveness for others, not necessarily because you believe they deserve it, because you deserve peace. Forgiveness for yourself for being incapable of holding back the pain that was abused upon you. Compassion for the states of humanity. Compassion for who you were at that time. Moving forward. Creating the life that you wish. Creating the person that you wish to be. Your principles, your development. And then finally in this real final pillar, moving closer to who you are. Which is to move closer to all of us. For those who do not know they are. And for those who do not know who they are. They surely do not know anyone else. So however you may find your connection back to who you are, it surely must be something done actively. I give you meditation because that's something I've been doing since every single day since I was about 18 or so. I still do it to this day. I'm 29 now. But I find meditation... And when we say meditation here, we're talking about connection back to myself, connection back to yourself. I find it in many activities. I find it in walking on the beach. I find it in making love with a woman. I find it in playing guitar. I find it in any moment that I'm able to delete my concept of self and time to enter the flow of things, the flow of now. I find it in making this video right now. For but a brief moment just now, Adam no longer exists. There's only now. 
who is saying these words? Surely I do not know where the next word will come from. I do not know. But what I do know is what I feel inside. And what I feel inside is what I know must surely exist within you. But for those of you that have blocked that out, blocked the knowing out of who you are, I'm here to tell you that you needn't resist any longer. For whatever you most resist is that which most needs to be illuminated. Who you most resist in forgiving is who most needs forgiving. Whether that be someone else or yourself. Is it not time for you to come to acceptance? Is it not time for you to come to compassion? Is it not time for you to finally let go of the past? In order to move forward. Is it not time. For you to know who you are. And in doing so. Relinquish this hurt locker. Which is but a concept. But a figment of your imagination. Eternally perpetuated by you breathing existence into it. So we're here. We are here. You know what you need to do. So go do it. If you feel the need, come back. Let me know how you went. Let me know what you discovered in a comment down below. In an email or a direct message. Let me know who you are. And we'll see what your hurt locker is then. But until then. Sending you all my love, peace, and joy. Ciao. And that brings me to my thanks for all of you. Thank you, first off, for just being here, your presence. But please let me know. Let me know in a comment down below where you are in your lives, how you felt about this, any commentary. I'll do my best to get back as soon as I possibly can. And also, if you did enjoy the content, please hit the thumbs up on the YouTube video. It just helps it get sent out to more people in the community. And if you feel like this would resonate with someone else, please share it to some of your close friends. If you would like to dive into one-on-one coaching, that's all available on boldojo.com. Guided meditation. Free resources of wisdom. Free weekly on my newsletter, Bold Sip. Just chuck your email in. comes out every Friday. That's all available. All the links down below. And if you would like to support the podcast directly, you can donate anything that you wish through the PayPal link down below or on the website, boldojo.com in the podcast section. Anything that you guys give is always super appreciated. So thank you very much. Wishing you all the love, peace, and joy in this life.